Hi, Brett. Thank you so much for joining us. I was looking forward to this conversation because you have been such an inspiration for me and for so many people on LinkedIn with sharing all of the the knowledge and the experiences that you've gathered over the years. I have I've just been taking you know little nuggets of information and little nuggets of inspiration from everything that you've been sharing and it's been just incredible. So I'm so thrilled to finally be able to talk to you and get to know more about your journey and how you think about leadership and speaking as a leader. So thank you so much for joining us. You're most welcome, Nasheen. I've really been looking uh, very forward to it. And I love your podcast. I, I listen to every one of them. I watch the clips. You've had some amazing guests on there. And I I have my note. I'm a big note taker. So I take notes whenever I'm I don't do that with every podcast, but definitely on yours I do. And you've just had some amazing guests. So so the feeling is mutual. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm I'm always constantly humbled by your support. So thank you. So welcome. I, I'm gonna ask you to do something impossible right off the bat. I'm going to ask you to tell us about your journey, your professional and life journey, which spans many countries, many continents, and decades. So it's a big ask, I know, but I would love to hear about it. And I'm sure everyone listening would love to hear about it. Great. Well, I'll I'll do my best to give you the maybe a two-minute version of it. So we'll we'll see where that takes us. And <laughs> We can go deeper uh, if you'd like into any aspect of it. I um, I grew up in the, uh, so I'm, I'm 58 right now. I retired from corporate life at 52, so so about six years ago, and just kind of going backwards from then. I grew up in the 1970s in a in a small, very small town in the U.S. when radio was a big deal. And of course, we had we had TV, but radio was really a big thing and and you know, um, being able to—I remember one of my one of my Christmas gifts that I kept asking for year after year after year, and then finally my my parents uh, got me a shortwave radio, and I just thought it was the coolest thing to be able to to uh, set up a big antenna on the uh, telephone poles and with fishing line and and set it up and listen to the BBC in London. That to me was uh, one of the big highlights of of my childhood growing up in the 70s. And that was also the, um, my dad uh, back then had told me something. He said, you know, Brett, he said, you know, what's amazing is that in our backyard, there are thousands of radio signals, both local and from around the world, just falling in the backyard. All you got to do is put up an antenna and you can listen to them. Now, that so I said okay so we did that but late later as I started my journey that I'm I'm about to describe it it formed the basis for my leadership and how I live my life which is basically never chase anything because you're gonna you're never gonna be happy if you're chasing someone or something don't chase it set up that antenna and attract it and enjoy it. And money works that way as well. Money worked that way uh, with, with myself, with my wife, as we uh, built wealth over a long-term career. And, and you know, we, we just, um, setting up an antenna means you upskill yourself, you develop yourself, you're constantly learning. I'm sure you and I will talk about a lot of this stuff later, but basically put up your antenna. And once you do that, work on yourself, you'll attract what you want, but don't chase things. Don't, which means don't take shortcuts. Don't commit fraud. Don't do things the easy way. Don't take the easy street. Be smart about it, but put up your antenna. Anyway, back to uh, the normal question here. I wanted to kind of get that in. So that was kind of my foundation. So I went to university as a, as a pre-engineer and after like five calculus courses, I kind of said, these numbers I don't want to live my life in numbers anymore, so I'd rather deal with people. So switch the major uh, to basically um, banking and finance. So 
anyway, make a long story short, got through uh, university after a couple of bumps. I quit university halfway through uh, because of my immaturity. Um, and, um, and, but I kind of got my act together, uh, read some books and that type of thing. And in a six month period, I kind of got back on track and went, finished, got my degree and then, um, applied for my first job right after my degree, good, high grade point average. And I, I got 24 declines and I was, I was applying in, in a part of the country, uh, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, which, which, which is in the state of Texas. And, and the banking industry was in the process of just shrinking at that point in time because the price of oil had gone down and banks were kind of cutting back. So, so we kind of got the hint after 24 declines said it better change the game a little bit here because there might be another 24 declines. And so, so anyway, my mother and I got in a car and started. So actually my mom, my dad and I had dinner, we flipped a coin heads was going to be the East coast tails was going to be the West coast and it was tails. So my mom and I got in the car we were going to go to LA and I was going to find a, find a job in Los Angeles. And we stopped in Las Vegas um, one of the stops on the on the drive out there, and we were driving by. I remember just like it was yesterday, um, a big Citibank building. This is the city that I think everybody uh, knows about worldwide. And and I said I, I'm going to go in there and get a job tomorrow morning. So I walked in there again, no experience, right? Walked in there, filled out the application. And uh, make a long story short, um, landed a job and a few weeks later was uh, living and launched my career. I spent 19 years with Citi as a banker. I did every job in the bank. I started as a cashier, a teller. I uh, uh, did sales. I did operations. I did le learned branch banking really well. And after five years in Las Vegas, um, and I became a manager and um uh, that had some pains with it because I wasn't trained to be a manager. And uh, then I got promoted to um, open an office in San Francisco. So I went to San Francisco for seven years. And and then um, there was a reorganization at the company and uh, my job was impacted. And um, I was a bit worried at the time, uh, but um, but I was only kind of unemployed for about two to three weeks. And then I got a call to go to Singapore because the Asian financial crisis had happened and the company wanted to retain me. So, because I, I was a, a really good performer. So, so basically I went to Singapore, um, um, lived in Singapore. I've lived there three times actually. And, and, um, and then after about a year and a half in Singapore, went up to Tokyo, uh, Japan, and I ran, uh, part of a big business up there and uh, six years in Japan and uh, then went back to Singapore. And then I got a call after 19 years uh, from one of my ex bosses who had changed companies and he was in the UK and he said, why don't you come over here? I've got a great leadership position, 2000 people. Why don't you switch company? I said, no, I, you know, I can't leave this company that gave me my first chance. And anyway, he worked on me and he convinced me to do it. So, so I went back. Um, so, so I left after 19 years, joined Barclays Bank in the UK and basically spent six years there and three in the UK and then three in the Middle East. I uh, lived in Dubai for a few years and then worked across uh, 14 uh, countries in the emerging markets in Africa, lived in a hotel in Zambia for a year and lived in Johannesburg for a while and and then basically um left the company kind of had enough of that stuff and and so my wife and I uh moved back to Las Vegas uh the house that I'm sitting in right now and we basically I got a call after a few months from one of my other bosses uh that wanted me to go back to Asia Singapore and run the run um Asia Pacific for um, and Australia, Aust Australia, New Zealand bank called ANZ. So I went back there and did that for about three and a half years. And that's, that's a short recap of my career, uh, with a little bit of detour there, Nasheen. Um, so we can go into any of that that you want, but that, that ought to be, I think, thorough enough for, for the listeners to, um, understand where I've been 30 countries, 30 years. That's what people should, should really take away from this. <laughs> wow. It's incredible. What I hear through that story is 
the story of flexibility and resilience. And I would love to know about all the skills that you've developed being in that multicultural environment, because I think that is such a unique, unique opportunity. And I feel that you really utilized it. And then as you were telling me before we started recording, you've also documented it. You've documented 19 years of your professional journey, which is 20, 29. Yeah, 29. 29. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, you know, the young kid that I was, so I started my career in 87. So, so that journey that I took with my mom to land a job at Citibank was started in 87. Mm -hmm. And in 1988, the, the bank, Citibank sent me and some other people to a Jim Rohn seminar. Now, for those listening that don't know who Jim Rohn is, he he was Tony Robbins' mentor. So mm -hmm. Tony Robbins uh, credits a big part of his uh, development to Jim Rohn. So I went to Jim one of Jim Rohn's seminars. And one of the things that Jim Rohn always says, and you can see his videos on YouTube, it's great. He, keep a journal. Write it down because don't don't assume that your brain is a filing cabinet. Write it down, capture it. And so the young naive kid that I was, I said he said to write it down. So I went back to work and bought me a little handwritten journal. There's 89 of them uh, now, mm -hmm. and by golly, I just wrote down stuff. Nasheen, you know, if I if I um, if if um, I had a hardship at work, uh, a great employee, let's say a, a, a great employee resigned early in my career. And I learned out why they resigned and it may have been related to me. It may have been related to other things. I wrote that down. I captured it. I learned it so that it could help me. But that has turned out to be one heck of a library now. And so my postings on LinkedIn every day, um, for those of you that follow me, um, all come from those books and their real experiences. Did I handle everything the right way? No, but, but, but one thing you're going to get is what actually really did happen. So I recommend that everybody, if you're not keeping a journal, keep it, start it today, because in the future, that library will be worth gold to you because you, it's impossible to remember everything. So yeah, it's a great discipline to have. Yeah. Really. And and continuing it for 29 years, it's, it's incredible. Um, yeah. So yes, I so I talked about you know me being interested in learning and, and getting to know about all the skills you picked up, which I think is again impossible. It's not possible to do that within forty five or fifty minutes. So I really want to hone down mm. on the skill of communication and speaking. And the first thing that I'm really interested in knowing, because I know that this that multiculturalism being exposed to different mm. kinds of environments, having to work with different kinds of teams with different backgrounds really stretches your ability as a communicator. And I also know that being a leader is really being a good communicator. You, those are one and the same. Mm -hmm. So I would love to know how, now that you look back over the last 30 years, how did the skill of communications, specifically in terms of speaking to your team and also speaking to larger audiences, how do you think that has evolved over time for you, especially in terms of evolving when you've had to communicate with people outside of outside of your uh, comfort zone, out, people that might not be native speakers of English, people that might not share your background. So I would love to know how that's evolved. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been that's a great it's a great question. And and I, I'll kind of address it uh, through two lenses. Uh, one is the cultural lens and the other is just the the experience and the evolution. And but you're spot on about the culture. So <clears throat> one of the challenges that I had to overcome in my career um, because I performed well, I was promoted rapidly throughout. And I was, I always found myself in a situation where I was leading people that were older than me. Now that didn't, that wasn't a problem with me, but it was a problem for some of them. 
And so I had to learn at a very young age um, how to um, um, earn the respect. And communication is a big reason why. And just before I get off the cultural thing, uh, living in and work, leaving a large business in Japan for um, six years, Nashin, when I was, you know, in Japan, uh, Japanese not being a language that I spoke, I had to, uh, in many parts outside of Tokyo, I would, ha as I went around the country, I'd need to have a translator with me. And so if you think about it, everything that you speak about is double the length of time if you're dependent upon a translator. So, so, and the way Japan, well, all the Asian countries are this way and nearly every country is this way, but in Japan um, and in Asia in general, a business card is sacred. Okay. Business card, how you handle a business card. You don't whip out a business card and slap it down on the table like these Americans do, right? If you do that, you will have zero respect anywhere. So business card, people are very proud of a business card and you handle it with care. In Japan, you don't shake hands, you bow and there's a way to, so, so all of these things um, go into how you communicate with people, right? And then you, I go down to um, the Middle East and, and Africa, speaking to the teams there, which are uh, in in Dubai, Dubai, as an example, incredibly diverse. I mean, you talk about diversity, it's very similar to Singapore in nature as well. So you're talking to different, um, uh, different um, uh, cultures, and it's more than just a gender, uh, you know, type of um, uh, 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 people in the room. You're not just talking to men, women. You're talking men, women from with different uh, religious beliefs, with different um, um, life beliefs, uh, with different uh, backgrounds and experiences, and and then you get into a local country like a Zambia, which where where some some of the people in Zambia uh, have not been outside of Zambia. So so all of these things go into. Uh, reading a room, as people say, or reading people, learning how to do that. So I had to to kind of learn as I went along, and I'm on a fast-moving train in the process of all of this, because if you think about a person like myself, Nashim, that's going into these different regions of the world, um, there's a reason why I'm doing that and not a local staff member, because you know I'm going to be more expensive to the company to do it than a local staff member, but I'm bringing some skills to the table. And I'm very proud of the fact that every single job that I've left except for one throughout my entire career, I have groomed a local member of that country to take over for me. And I'm very proud of that. And so that came through in my communication. So the, so the cultural aspect, Nasheen, is how you communicate. The second part, the second lens I'd like to talk about on your question is what you communicate. Okay, so, and I learned, it took me 19 years to learn this as part of my own leadership journey. It was painful when I switched companies uh, from City to Barclays, and I all of a sudden had 2,000 people uh, that I was responsible for. I learned after about three to four weeks after going around the U the UK, meeting my team, and then trying to uh, mobilize the business that I didn't know anything about leadership. I was great at management. I was great at uh, a lot of the uh, things in Citibank that I'd been at 19 years. Their culture or their ecosystem, um, things were just kind of built in where you could just get in and do the job. But outside of, I, I got out of that, it was kind of like I tell people, it was like I was a saltwater fish in saltwater. And then I get over to, to another company and it's freshwater and I'm a saltwater fish. So what's going to happen here? And so I fortunately had uh, the, bo the boss that hired me, um, took me, he took me to dinner and basically said, Brett, you know, I hate to say this, but you don't know a lot about leadership. You're willing to learn. And anyway, make a long story short, that's where mentors are so important. And um, 
so anyway, he he um he kind of mentored me, but he was also my boss and he brought me along that journey six to nine months and I learned the soft skills. I learned um, you know, how to connect with people. I learned a concept. Uh, getting back to your question about, okay, what to communicate? Um, how did that evolve with me? I use a concept. I learned during that period something called ALA, ask, listen, act. So when I'm going to communicate, usually uh, with large teams of people, I want to make sure they're engaged, like you and I are right now. We're you and I are deeply engaged. It's it's that's your only focus, my only focus right now. And we're, if I say something, you say something. We're we're like locked locked in. But when you're t talking to hundreds of people, thousands of people, um, it's important that you find a way to engage and connect with them. And so I learned that ALA is something really good. It takes a lot of preparation, but what you do is you you um, you ask people, what is important to you? Okay. What is your pain point? What uh, problems are you facing that you would like to see leadership fix? And, and you're going to get a long list. I remember I did this in Zambia <laughs> and we had 187 things that they wanted from me. And there was no way that we could do 187 things. Right. So we, we captured them all. And uh, so, so the A is to ask questions, ask those kind of questions. Then the L is to listen, make sure you listen. You know, a lot of people, Nasheen, they ask questions and then they just don't listen. They just kind of go through the motions. And, and these are people that wind up being poor leaders and they fall flat on their face like I almost did, right? So, so you listen, you take it down. And then the A, the third A is action, is your action plan. So ALA, ask, listen, act. So when you're going to act, and so that 187 items in that example, we I decided um, that I was a CEO of that business. So I decided that we're going to do these five. So here you gave me 187. I'm going to do these five. And here's why I can't do the other 182. And I remember that was a that was a three hour session. We got everybody in a big auditorium and I got up and explained why we couldn't do those other 182, but they were happy with five. Okay. And then I said, now these are five things I want from you. And then we went through and we negotiated. So we took kind of 10, ten things There's a little bit of overlap. And then we kind of agreed on these three things. So all of my communication for the next year and a half was based on those three things. Okay. Everybody was bought in fully engaged. Um, so, so, so we could get it. We, I, I remember getting up on a stage and I had my boss and my boss's boss and his boss, they all came through, they, they flew in on the corporate jet and they wanted to have a town hall meeting. And we had hundreds of people in the room in Lusaka, Zambia, and we uh, we talked about the journey that we had been on, and it it just worked like it was totally unrehearsed. And these bosses got off the stage backstage to me after we um, did our our town hall, and they said, "We've never seen anything like this before. This is unbelievable. How did you do that?" And it was A L A. And so the community because they had only seen the communication part, they hadn't seen the journey part, but the communication went so smoothly because we had done the preparation. And I talk a lot about elite performance um, uh, because I truly believe that there's a reason why the top decile usually are the same people in any organization. And the, the best leaders are usually the same people as well, which means that one out of 10 people are going to be there. The other nine out of 10 just don't quite get it all. Doesn't mean they're bad people, right? Don't get me wrong, but but they're just not there. So I talk a lot about elite performance and there's three things that elite performers do. They prepare, okay? They trust that preparation and then they do it, okay? Prepare, trust, and do. Those three things. Now, a lot of people prepare and they, spend, they become a full-time lifetime student <laughs> and they never do anything. So, so they're constantly, so, or they prepare for something 
And then they actually, uh, Nasheen, they wind up, then when it comes time to apply what they prepared for, they don't trust their preparation. They go, I got to go back mm. and I need to study some more, you know, and that's natural. It's natural for most people to feel, which is why the elite performers, they trust that preparation and they move on. Right. So they, and they don't relearn things because it's a waste of time. So once you learn something, keep up on it, keep up with changes, changes to the economy, changes to, well, the pandemic changed the world. You and I were talking a couple of weeks ago about that. So, so you got to keep up with those things, re refresh your learnings, but you don't need to relearn everything, right? Just, and, and there comes a point that you just have to get out there and do it. So I, I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, you, you, I love that you went into the, the frameworks that you've developed and lived by over the years. I, I there's so many things that I want to, talk about and and reflect on I'll start at the at the end so I love that you talked about preparation trust and then doing it and it's exactly what I experienced as a filmmaker I as soon as you said it I could really slot that in into that experience because when you're on a film set you are in execution mode everything that you've done before that leads into that you're at the stage mm. where you cannot be thinking or rethinking or overthinking anything. You've done the thinking before and you have to trust that you did the right kind of prep. And this is where I see a lot of people really struggle, exactly like you said, that they start doubting themselves. They start thinking, oh yeah, I know I planned it this way, but maybe this way is better. And if you do that at the execution stage, what are you looking at? You're looking at mm -hmm. deadlines that aren't going to be met. You're looking at mm -hmm. teams that are going to look at you and think this leader cannot make up their minds. You're looking at people being dissatisfied, the, the, the end customer being dissatisfied because they feel that they can't really trust you if you cannot trust yourself. So yeah. it's it's a great framework and I really think it applies in in so many situations especially when you're when you're really preparing for something which is going to be very time bound it's going to be extremely crucial to to execute exactly on time and get results on time hmm. yeah and, and I think your 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 original question to me I gave a lot of context with the answer, but but back to your original question about the communication, this uh, prepare, trust, and do uh, type of method that elite performers do, it it does impact your confidence in communicating because let's say that you don't trust your own preparation. It's going to come through. You're going to come through as less confident when you're communicating whatever it is you're communicating if you don't trust your own preparation, you're going to, you're going to feel, oh, you're going to get more nervous and that type of thing as well. Whereas if you trust the work that you've put into it and you're just going to let yourself go, you're going to be a lot more relaxed and natural, uh, whether it's in person, on camera, in, in the real world, in the digital yeah. world, whatever it is, right? And you can be the more, you, you talk about this all the time, the authentic you, right? Uh, you can, you can be the more natural person if you trust yourself and your preparation. And to me, th this forms the foundation of confidence for an elite performer um, is, is, is that that's actually how you, in my opinion, build confidence is prepare, trust, and do. Mm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Having that level of confidence in yourself is so important and frankly, very game changing, because if mm -hmm. you have these negative self narratives that you've that you're building for yourself in your mind and you're letting that take over, that's where the doubt really comes from. And mm. like you said, it it does come out in the way that you communicate. You start expressing more doubt. You start saying oh, we could do it this way, but we could also do it this way. Ah, I don't know. Maybe we try it this way and then we do. Exactly. 
And I've I've seen firsthand how that can really result in in disaster. So taking you know the all the different things that you said, especially also about the multiculturalism culturalism piece of it and how you learn to communicate in different contexts. If we were to look at Brett, who was this new leader, let's say 30 years ago, and the Brett that you are now, if I was to ask you the top three ways that you've changed in the way that you speak, in the way that you communicate, what would those be? Great question. Um, I would say one is to relevance is always um, in the front of my mind. So if I'm going to speak about anything, one of the filters that I run it through, Nasheen, is relevance. I want to be relevant. What kind of impact can I make? Because if you think about communication or or speaking right to anybody, you are interrupting their time because they could be doing something else. You know, you you and I could both be doing something else right now, right? And we've chosen to invest our time with each other right now. So let's be relevant to one another. We're doing that now. It's no different if you're going to get up and speak in front of 2,000 people, right? It's the same thing. What do you, when they go home and they're having breakfast with their family the next morning, what do you want them to say at that kitchen table about what they did last night when they saw you speak? So number one is relevance for those reasons. I would say number two is the connection uh, piece as well. I, you know, I didn't know how to connect with people. I mean, I was a good salesperson and I was a good teller cashier uh, back when I was, you know, 30 years ago, but I didn't really know how to connect with people and start to, and and we shared a few minutes ago about the ALA approach and that's how I do it. So I would say that that's the bread of today that I always uh, like to learn. When you and I met, that's, I didn't tell you, but I was applying my own ALA to, to every new person that I meet uh, that I want to add relevance to and see if they can be relevant to me. Um, that connection is so very important. And I every day uh, make it part of my mission to add value to people, but you can only do that if you can connect with them. Otherwise, it's artificial. And that's where the authenticity that, that you and I often talk about really comes in. You have to really be authentic to connect with somebody. I would say the um, the last piece is one that most people probably would never answer. And I'm, I'm just going to put it out there. What makes me different than other people is that I learned how to thrive in adversity in business. Nasheen. And I, the nastier, uglier, deeper recession, volatility, problem, attrition, people quitting left and right. Uh, I, I was sent down to Zambia on half a day's notice uh, because the price of copper had tanked and the um, the retail credit portfolio had taken a 30 million pound sterling loss. And they were changing the CEO and they wanted me to go down and do an assessment and kind of clean things up and get the business back on track. That's that's how I wound up from Dubai down to Zambia. And so I remember taking the overnight flight uh, down there and and uh, thinking about what I was going to do. And and uh, I had the the um, what I call now fortunate experiences of going navigating teams through crisis before. Uh, I mentioned the Asian financial crisis, 1997. Um, I was in Japan in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, that was chaos for anybody in the financial services industry because people couldn't access their money. And we had to keep stability in, we, we were the number one market share an FX bank in Japan at the time. And that was at a time that Japan was the number two economy. It was ahead of China in, in the world. It was a big business and people could not get their money. Imagine how my employees felt 
that had to deal with the pressure of the customer. So I would say the third one is dealing with adversity. And I've learned, I, I use something called adversity quotient. Uh, most people haven't heard, they, they hear about IQ and they hear about EQ and a guy named Brett gets up there and talks about AQ and they've never heard that. And so the adversity quotient is something uh, that I, I'm not the only one that, that can do this, but, but this is probably reflective in the bread of today uh, to get back to your question that, that I know how to nav successfully navigate businesses through adversity. I love those three pieces. Thank you for sharing mm. that. I love that the first two are interconnected, relevance and connection, mm. because to achieve relevance and to achieve connection, you have to step outside of yourself. You have to start thinking of the person you're talking to, the audience that you're addressing. It's no longer about me, me, me. It's about right. how you can contribute and give value. And that's where you make the most mm -hmm. impact. And it's a very humbling lesson to learn because we always think as mm -hmm. when we're younger, we often seem to think that, oh, being a leader is so glamorous. It's all about showing people how amazing you are and impressing people with all these great things that you've done. And people are going to put me on a pedestal and they're going to love mm. and adulate. And exactly. none of that is yeah. true. And it's it's definitely, not. Definitely not true anymore because when you're speaking as a leader, you are essentially showing people what you can do for them. And that right. is the question that every single person listening to you will have. What can this person do for me? How can I benefit? It, yeah, exactly. Now, I just say one, one thing on top, because you're talking, this is the most important point, probably. I view leadership. I even have even a higher bar than that with leadership that that I learned later in my career after that 19 year you know hiccup I talked about earlier. I learned that and my bar is set where I want to impress the families of my employees. Because if you can become the topic of conversation, can you believe what Brett did? To better support, and if they if they're talking about that at home, I'm not around with their family. I have cashiers today, Nasheen from Zambia. Every morning, they will send me a text message, and I haven't been to the country in in uh, over ten years, right? I, for various reasons, mm -hmm. they text me and say, "Good morning, Brett." These these were cashiers back then. I was a CEO of the largest bank in the country, and they wish me a good morning every day. I get a text. It just brings tears to my eyes because that's the kind of impact that myself and the leadership team made on these cashiers. And they they haven't seen anything like that since then, right? And unfortunately, but, you know, I think that, that um, um, it makes me very proud to impress people to the point with the objective of making sure that the family is taken care of because that affects how you make compensation decisions and all, uh, how you design performance management systems. And it's all part of the ecosystem because I believe that leaders are responsible for the village and the thriving. Everybody needs to eat. Okay. But it doesn't mean the leader needs to catch the fish, but the leader should provide the fishing pole and uh, teach people how to catch fish and then let them catch fish. And then the leader can go teach somebody else how to, how to cook the meal. Right. And, and that type of thing as well. And so, so if leaders would only look at the family as well, right. Indirectly, uh, I think you get the point uh, then the, the bar would be so much higher. And I think people would then put up that radio antenna going back to my dad's analogy as well. Um, and you're going to attract the very best people in the marketplace, and they're going to be loyal for life, uh, just like these cashiers that that still text me every day, right? Hadn't seen them in 10 years. And I think that is really a testament to how you made them feel when yeah. you were there as the CEO. If you made someone who couldn't 
potentially benefit you in any way who couldn't really be, you know, significant in your career, if you really look at it from that mm-hmm. lens, if you were able to make someone like that feel valued and yeah. like they were contributing in a meaningful way, knowing that there's really nothing in it for you, that's really right. success for me. Yeah, and and just just another completely different thing, but the same same mindset. So go back to the Japan days. Um, I remember after three weeks in Japan, I went around the country on the bullet trains and all of this stuff. And I called a meeting with my direct reports and I said, I've got one question for for all of you. Why is there only one woman branch manager? That we had 24 branches and these were big, uh, high profit um, uh, machines, basically. And and I said, I said, why is there only one woman? And they looked at me like, how dare you ask that question? You know, I mean, Japan, frankly, is one of the most chauvinistic countries yeah. in the world, one, one of them. And so fast forward 18 months later, uh, Nashing, we had more than half were women. Now, the complexity of doing that in a place like Japan where you don't fire people, that's something else about Japan. Many people don't, you, you don't fire people in Japan unless somebody like breaks the law or something like that. But you de- have to demote people. So, th- but through a but by redesigning a performance system where where it was more equitable and people could could um, actual perform, then I appointed women, and it got to the point that the regulator, the government in Japan, became nervous about all these women that I was appointing, and it was me. It was my head. I was responsible. So they came in and did an inspection. And we came out of that fine. There wasn't a problem. But the, and by the way, they were all men with the government. Mm, of course. Okay. That was part. So you get back to the cultural thing. So in, in countries, there's different ways of, of, um, of doing things. And, but I don't have any regrets at all. And these women, I'm very proud of these women right now uh, who were finally given the chance that they were actually earning before, but they were just, um, you know, compressed uh, due to the culture. And we just lifted that top and, and it was great. So yeah, that, that's what leadership is really all about. How do you take a complex uh, cultural challenge, all sorts of other issues, like these couple of examples I've given you, and how do you actually make it look like it's easy, right? And impact the lives of, the, of these people and, and how they feel using your words. This is such an incredibly important and frankly, very personally relevant point for me. So I love that you brought this up because as a person who's also been exposed to different kinds of cultures and and, and countries, I often think about this. It's a very fine line to walk between understanding the nuances of different cultures in which you operate, but also sticking to your own values and understanding Mm. that there are some things that are not going to change, regardless of which culture you're working in or living in. That is a line that is very, very difficult for a lot of people, including me, to navigate. It is. Yeah, me me too. It's not easy, right? (laughs) Yeah, because you see people kind of on either extreme and you realize that is Mm. not where you want to be. You don't want to be the person who's just blindly saying yes, everything's right to every single culture because, yes, there are cultures where they are going to have these values that you don't agree with and you can feel it in your bones that even if this entire culture believes in this, I'm sorry, I don't. And I respect that you believe in it, but at the same time, if it's going to affect our work, I'm sorry, there's going to be, there are going to be some changes. Or you've also seen people at the other extreme who just don't even care about being culturally sensitive and just say, this is how we do it back in the headquarters. And that's how we're going to do it in every other branch, wherever you are in the world. We, we don't really care. I, I always really, I'm always very thankful for my early training at Procter and Gamble because I worked in the Pakistani office where We were very proud of the American culture of the company because that's where the roots are. And we 
had this really incredible balance between, okay, taking care of people in a local way, understanding the local culture and nuances, but staying true to the values of the company so that no matter right. where in the world you go, if you go to a PNG office, you're going to encounter similar people with similar mm -hmm. values. So you have to have the same uh, purpose, uh, values, and principles. Well, that's what we called it at PNG, the PVPs. So you had the same purpose, values, and principles, mm. regardless of whether you worked in Pakistan or you worked in, in the UAE or you worked in China. So mm -hmm. navigating that, that, that line is really, really difficult, especially if you're, if you're speaking and you're communicating. Right. Have you? It, it is that? because you always have this local pull, right? And you've got the, the pull and usually the, the, one of the leaders in that pull is the government. So it's important. You can't ignore it and you can't operate as using your words on the extremes. You've got to kind of work in the gray area. It's not black and white. It's not it's not just, you know, crystal clear the pathway you take. And this is where experience um, experience guides you. And if you don't have that experience, then you have to have a method like uh, prepare, trust, do like like we spoke about earlier, ALA. You've got to get down to these, these are what I call my roots, where where you can, they'll work everywhere. They're going to be different how you implement them everywhere, but go back to your roots. And that's my advice to everybody listening to this right now. If you're going to be working across different countries, it's incredibly complex. The currency alone makes life complex. Um, especially if you're in banking, uh, because the currencies are all different and things, which means that things beyond your control are going to determine a big, not all of your fate, but a big part of your fate. So you have to learn to accept that and understand those complexities and still communicate, do the things that we're talking about here while blocking out some of the things that are, it's going to be radio static on the radio interference. You don't, nobody likes static on the radio or a blurry video, right? Nasheen, <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> we want to, we want to make sure everything is clear and, and things are, you know, uninterrupted and we can really focus in on, on doing it this way and being a successful leader. A lot of it is also how do you block out the noise, right? And decide what you're going to focus on. And, but if you're living off the, on the extremes, how can you be relevant? And that relevancy question usually will get people off the extremes, right? Because anybody can work on the extremes, right? Yeah. But what kind of value are you really adding if you do that? That's a great, great connection. Yeah. Um, we're, we're at time. So I wanted to ask if you're okay to go for another 10 to 15 minutes. You bet so I am. Like yeah, I love this. <laughs> I you. I, I think that I love talking to people that that also have the uh, you know cross cultural experiences working for a multinational company because that does create uh, some some complexities and it's very different. It'd be very different than working for a local uh, Pakistani company. You know, I know I, I know Pakistan uh, very well, and I know people that work. I have somebody on my program that is the HR director for the National Bank of Pakistan. And uh, we had 24,000 people watch our our discussion there. And But inside of a local bank is completely different than inside of a multinational bank in the same country. Yes. I would I would not dare to work for a local company in, in Pakistan. I never did. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I would have survived for very long in that kind of environment. Just... Like you said, it's it it's very homogenous and and patriarchal, and that is not right. an environment I thrive in, which is which is interesting, right? Because you talked about thriving in adversity, and yeah. it's a very interesting concept for me because of course adversity is inevitable, and understanding how to thrive in it is only going to take you from strength to strength. But at the same mm. time, if you can if you have control over your environment, then understanding how to shape the environment in a way that is not hostile and not adverse is also an entire skill set, which I feel that leaders really have that responsibility to understand mm -hmm. the environment that they're building. 
And I can always see a, a parallel here with uh, the speaker on a stage in any room. If you're the person who's addressing the audience, you're the one who's setting the vibe for the room. You're the one who's giving them the signal that this is going to be a boring lecture, but you are just going to sit through it because that's how it is. Or you're giving them the vibe that, no, I'm actually here to engage with you and interact with you. This is not a one-way street. It's going to be a two-way conversation, regardless of whether it's me on the stage and you in the audience or the other mm -hmm. way around. So it's it's that responsibility of setting the vibe, setting the environment, reading the room, as you said, going along and adjusting that is really the the skill that I admire a lot, and I really value that skill a lot. Yeah, I think you're I think you're spot on, and you know it's interesting that um, that you know I haven't worked for a corporation in the USA since 1998. That's a long time ago. Yeah, I'm that old, right? But so I so so kind of getting back to the experience that you get, no way would would you work for a local Pakistani company? There's actually no way that I would work for an American company that was just purely domestic. I wouldn't do it because I thrive on the complexity of dealing with uh, multicultures, multi uh, currencies, um, you know, different methods of, we, we talked about uh, the business card in Asia and how things are so different. I actually thrive and flourish in that environment instead of the environment of the country that I grew up and was educated in, which is America. And frankly, I'm not. If you look at how the American economy has handled the COVID economy versus Asia, for example, um, America's dead last place just with something called the great resignation and yeah. leadership has really just blown it. Not all leaders, but a lot of the majority of leaders has blown it. And the younger generations are checking out. They're leaving. They're, they're not going to tolerate this stuff of you're going to, you let me work from home. And then you want me to be on a zoom at eight o'clock at night. Um, and I've got a baby to take care of, you know, that happened, that kind yeah. of thing is going on, but you, that's not happening in Singapore, okay? That's not happening in KL, okay? That's not happening in Manila. That's not happening in Bangkok, okay? I know that. I know that. I know people there, uh, people I used to work with. So, so I think that for those listening to this that hold America up mm. as the model that everybody goes to, it, it's really a great example of how not to do it from a people perspective. Okay. Now I'm not sitting here badgering the country, but I'm, I'm talking about a specific area of leadership mm -hmm. through adversity because had COVID not happened and some other factors as well, then maybe we wouldn't have these issues. Right. Uh, but the fact is we do. And people we're finding out that people in America are not that good at handling this stuff. You know, today, today's news, um, mm -hmm. Amazon is laying off 18,000 people. Microsoft is laying off 10. So that's 30,000 people, right? Now, now that I'm getting a little bit off subject here, but the point is that Silicon Valley companies have been held up as the poster child for um, resiliency in the pandemic era economy. But now we're kind of seeing things, uh, the air come out of the tires here a bit as well. So so I think that there's there's a place to be humble. And there are places like Asia, for example, that America should look for as the role model uh, to reshape themselves. And that's not going to happen, by the way. But I, I think that, that <laughs> I, I hope that somebody hears this and they get so upset with what I said that maybe they'll one day look in that mirror as you and I were talking earlier and say, you know what, maybe I'm the problem. And then that will make lives much better because it's not going to be long, Nasheen, before the generation Y and Z 
are the majority of the workforce, you know, and uh, and then guess who who's going to lead these people as well? You know, they're going to have to there's going to have to be leaders that emerge from that as well. And so I think that there's the uh, the workforce, you know, China uh, yesterday, uh, China came out and and their population has shrunk for the first time in 60 years. OK, mm -hmm. these are these uh, Japan has issues as well. So it, there's a lot of things that are happening um, in the global economy that this stuff that you and I are talking about, the people that can grasp these concepts will the marketplace will reward these people handsomely in the future. I really agree with that philosophy. I actually came across this very young when I think when I was an undergrad, I believe it was inspired by um, a French philosopher called Michel Foucault. And I, he said, if you can understand the way that different philosophies and systems of thought operate without getting too attached to one specific way of doing things, mm -hmm. but picking and choosing the parts of from different philosophies, different cultures, different schools of thought that you like and creating your own philosophy out of it. If you can do that, then that is the absolute best way to have a balanced worldview. And that really stuck with me because at this point, I, I cannot tell you that I identify as being Pakistani or I identify as being Asian or I even that I identify mm. as being European. I, I just became French last year. And yes, I identify in some ways as being French, especially as my new identity. But I I would never say that one country, one culture has it all worked out. And that is the absolute best way of doing things. And yeah. I am never going to do things any other way because that is that's really dooming yourself to disaster. I think so. I think you're right. I think you're spot on about that. And, you know, I mean, it, I'm, I'm so, a very similar mindset to you that I kind of consider myself a, maybe a global citizen. Mm -hmm. Passport is not that relevant. Uh, I mean, a U.S. Pa passport is um, not very relevant on the list of the most powerful passports in the world. I think Japan's number one. Um, in the uh, in the world that way, but there's anyway. I, I think we're getting a little off topic here, but I agree with you that that uh, that having a global mindset. You know, when I look at the world, Nasheen, I look at the world as a series of islands. Japan's a big island in the Pacific, and and um, you've got you've got mainland China right there as well, and then you've got Australia, this big island down south, right? I just kind of you start to look at the world a little bit differently as a series of islands. The UK is an island in the Atlantic and, uh, and that type of thing. And it's a globally connected world. And the digital technology and what you and I are doing right now uh, is, is even a, a more human and immediate way to, to actually uh, connect globally. And I think people th that can understand the topics that you and I are talking about on this podcast, and if they'll start to study them, do their own preparation, they will be able to thrive in the future, uh, in the future world and help to lead a lot of the younger generations and develop leaders within those younger generations in the future. And the rewards will be amazing if they're able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I want to talk about your speaking and your especially talking about uh, you addressing bigger audiences. I can see now that you're a very skilled communicator and very aware of what it takes to communicate well. Was it always the case, especially when you were addressing a large audience? So I'm specifically interested in knowing if you remember the very first time that you addressed a large audience and were you nervous was there anything that you did to prepare yourself and how did it go? Yeah. So, so I've had my share of, um, of uh, pains and learning in the process. I guess, I guess the first one that pops into my mind is probably when I was in Japan and, and uh, getting up there with a translator talking about state of the business to, I don't know, probably a few hundred people in Tokyo 
and then smaller smaller uh, places and uh, places like Osaka and Hokkaido, etc. But I, I remember a specific evening in Tokyo where I just prepared all afternoon for this, and, and this is before I really learned how to trust my preparation. So I knew to prepare, right? I was smart enough to do that. So I prepared everything, had the slides already, and and uh, that type of thing, and. And it, it kind of got to the point in the preparation where I, I just kind of threw up my arms in frustration saying, you know, what do I really want to communicate here? Why, why do I have to show these slides and these numbers and all this other stuff? And, and so I, I remember taking my, uh, the translator that, that helped me with all of this uh, for coffee. And, uh, and I said, I'm just going to get up there and we're not going to show any slides and i'm just going to kind of wing it because i just can't for the life of me come up with the so i couldn't not to answer your question i couldn't come up in this first big speech with the message that i wanted to get across it, it, there was just i think i was trying too hard and what i've learned in life now, now i know actually that was the problem so they're there and this is my advice to those listening to this i stripped the word the phrase trying harder from my vocabulary it does not exist you will never see me write that trying harder because i believe that when you try too hard to do something you put so much pressure on yourself that you begin to paralyze and and it does not come out as yourself so in that speech back to your question I was just, um, despite me not going to do slides and everything, I was just kind of frozen. I wasn't myself. I got through it. And, you know, and I think the crutch of a translator helped me uh, because he he cared about me and he was able to kind of put a spin on what I said. And it, it re got through it okay. And it got better over time. Uh, but if I fast forward a few years later, when I was in the U.K., we had we rented out the old Manchester train station in Manchester, England, and we had I don't know something like twelve hundred people. It was a huge thing. Brought in all these chairs, and and uh, I was going to give a speech to this business that I was taking over, and and uh, we we're going to have kind of an all day, a two day event, and so I was the it was my session of my team, and I had guests coming in and everything. So I prepared for the for everything, and I did okay with that. And I was starting to learn to trust my preparation. So I get up in there as well, and it happens. But the auditorium was so big, it echoed. And I kind of got hung up, Nasheen, in the echoing and wondering, am I? And then I became too conscious about what, about my speech, uh, because I was focusing on the echoing coming in. And it was just a really poor, the, the acoustics were really poor, right? Mm -hmm. It's like static on a radio station. It very distract it, it distracted me more than it did the 1200 people, I think. <laughs> but got through it. And then my boss pulled me to the side at lunch that day. And he said, you know, Brett, he said, part of the, in addition to the acoustics being awful here, you need to talk to your events team because the first row of chairs between the stage and the first row of chairs was there was this huge gap. He said, mm -hmm. these chairs should always be close to the stage where you can connect with the audience because it creates a subconscious uh, barrier between you and the audience when you're so far away from the first row. And it's one thing to be in the back of the row, but if you're in the first row and you're still not very close, you know, you want to be like Elton John does it, right? You want to be right there and uh, that type of thing. So I learned a lot. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but these were two kind of painful experiences. But once I learned from that, then I got I got hold of my events team and I said, this is the way. And then I became, uh, I wouldn't say an expert, but covering these basics was something mm -hmm. that uh, that I was able to do so that the environment around me is like this, the, my home office right now where I'm talking to you from in Las Vegas. I'm I'm comfortable here. The yeah. the airflow is okay. I don't need to worry about the lighting, the microphone, you know, all of this. So I'm not dealing with a, an annoying echoing sound. So I think that my key learning in my speaking evolution, Nasheen, was was actually 
um, getting the basics in the environment, right? It's kind of like being a leader, get the culture right. And then it becomes a lot easier and more effective to lead people. And it's the same thing with speaking. Make sure that you eliminate the distractions. They will happen. I mean, our video camera could go blank any minute and we'd have to deal with that, but but we're resilient, right? Uh, but, but try to cover the basics. Mm-hmm. Don't try too hard to do something in your preparation. Trust your preparation and just, just jump in. You know, I've told you this even before today that sometimes, you know, if I, I know the topic I'm going to talk about, I really don't put pressure on myself because I'll just get up there and I'll wing it at the beginning if I don't know what to say. And then, but I'll get into the groove because I know the subject really, really well. And so ever since those two examples I gave you, one in Japan, one in in the in Manchester, England, um, I would say that later in my career in Zambia, and I remember um, in Hong Kong during when I worked for the Australian New Zealand Bank, I was in, in Hong Kong. Uh, gave some large, uh, large auditorium speeches in Singapore as well, Taipei and uh, Jakarta. And and so it, it just became natural where I just made sure that these say, OK, am I going to have a microphone? Is there going to be a podium? I don't want any barriers between me and the other people. And so once I kind of got that hygiene right, I call it hygiene, then I could just get up there. And it's like you and I talking to you right now. It just feels natural, relaxed we're connected, we're engaged. And I think that's what's important for people. Anyway, that's that's a bit, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You brought up some really interesting points. Definitely, I think the, the way to really succeed on any stage is to prepare and to take account of all the previous things that you've experienced, all the previous times that you've been on stage and understand what you can do just a little bit better the next time, how you can create that environment, like you said, get all the right things in place, get all your ducks in a row so that you can go out there and then perform at your best, but also understanding that things will go wrong. It's inevitable. You can't have... 100% 100% perfect performance where everything goes smoothly. I I don't think I've, I don't right. think I can tell you that Not any of happen. my times on stage have been like that. <laughs> of course, there have been better and worse times, but I can't tell you this have been absolutely 100% perfect. So knowing that you're going to prepare, also knowing that things that are unpredictable are going to happen, that are going to be beyond your control, and then mm-hmm. developing that mindset to adapt on the fly for me that's really that that magic formula where you can be that person in that room with the echo and be able to to continue and i'm sure if you're in that environment now it's not going to phase you because you've been in so many rooms since then and dealt with so many things that have been much much worse and much much more challenging oh so, yeah i mean i remember one time i was I, I pretty much had the job, but they wanted me to talk to some of the executive team members of the Australian bank. And it was one of them was going to be on a video. So I went to this is before Zoom became uh, popular. You had to go to these locations. I remember I was here in Las Vegas this 20, 2012, early 2012. And I went to this conference that offered video conferencing. That's where the bank sent me. And so you're going to talk to somebody in Australia. So I get on. And basically, the, his camera is not working on the two-way video. So he said, look, Brad, he said, uh, I don't know what's wrong with the camera. I can see you, but you can't mm-hmm. see me. Um, do you want to proceed? He said, because you're going to be at a disadvantage. He told me this. This is an interview, right? And and I said, I, I don't mind. You know, yeah. because because at that point in my adult life, I had been through all these experiences that you just described and and we spoke about and. So I kind of said, you know, I, it doesn't matter to me if if I can't see him as well. And if I'm at a disadvantage, mm-hmm. so be it. He can kind of, he knows that. And uh, that's an opportunity for me to actually show him how good I am uh, dealing with that adversity because that that happens as well. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I mean, I, I haven't thought about that in, in ages, actually. But um, 
yeah, that was about 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago when that happened. <laughs> and that's amazing because you were able yeah. to, you were able to form that connection just through the voice and you were able yeah. to imagine what this person was saying. And he was watching me, by the way, right? Yeah. Because I was, my camera was on and he was yes. able to see me. So, you know, I'm looking at the lens here, but anyway, you just kind of learn, like with anything you learn from these experiences to, you know, to go through, which leads me, if I could, Nasheen, I'd like to just really quickly touch on the adversity quotient a little bit, because I think the listeners could benefit from this because oh, yes. most people haven't heard of this. And I talked about adversity quotient, but I, th there's three things that I do whenever adversity hits. Okay. So if like, if the camera goes dark, let, let's say two minutes from now and, and the microphone has static in it, uh, we could apply what I'm talking about. So those three things to build your AQ, your adversity quotient are number one, whatever happens, don't blame yourself. Number two, don't blame the other person or a group of people or whatever. Okay. Just don't, the blame game does not work. It's not going to solve a problem. Okay. So just, just, don't, so don't blame yourself. Don't blame others. And number three, understand that whatever happens, it's not of cosmic importance. We're going to be okay. And given the time, look at the pandemic, right? Yeah. So, so the pandemic, it, it's very unfortunate that so many people lost their lives and, and I, I'm, it just breaks my heart that we can't bring them back. But the pandemic, if you look at it through an economic lens, uh, the world is getting through the pandemic, right? So, so try to see things from that perspective that if, if our camera goes dark right now and we have a problem with, with, with this podcast, you know what, five years from now, you and I are just going to laugh about it. You know, it's not a big deal. So we don't need to sweat it and uh, everything's going to be okay. And I found that these three things, whether we're dealing with the post 9-11 in Japan and trying to keep our hundreds of people calm so that they can support them so they can deal with customers or whether it was transforming the business in Zambia, these adversities will strike. And they strike when you least expect it. The global financial crisis, 2008, you know, these things happen. And so it's really, how are you going to deal with it? This adversity quotient and these recommendations that I just discussed will help anybody get through any situation much better than without it. Thank you. Thank you for, mm. for going through that. It's It's always about understanding the magnitude of the situation. And hmm. we're fortunate that most of the time, it's not going to be super serious. Most of the time, you're not going to have very serious consequences. But even in the times that you are, if you're undergoing extreme loss of a loved one, for example, yes, mm -hmm. it is serious. So just understanding that situation and taking yeah. it for what it is, I think it, that that has really helped me really figuring out that yes it is it is terrible i'm not gonna it's the you know i'm not gonna yeah. make bones about it it's a horrible place to be in and then it's up to me to figure out how to deal with it because nasheen no one else is gonna deal with this no one else is gonna hold your hand right. through it it is gonna be you so it's up to you to figure out how to react, how to formulate your mm -hmm. strategy to dig your way out of this hole, because guess what? Life has created this crater for you, and that's where you are right now. And it's right. that's what it is. That's what the situation is. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really about creating that strategy, getting that adversity quotient up high so that you can yeah. deal with all these curveballs that life can and will throw at you. You bet they will when you least expect it. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. This is a great note for us to end on. I think we've covered so much and yet I feel like we could talk for hours. So thank you so much, Brett, for taking the time for sharing your wonderful experiences and 
the strategies and frameworks that you've shaped and crafted out of those experiences. I think those have been really invaluable for me to learn and to understand. And I love that we can apply those to different situations in, in mm-hmm. leadership and communication and in professional and, and personal lives. The, you know, the ALA framework, especially I feel can really transcend and can be used anywhere in any situation if people really want to apply it. So thank you again for sharing that with us. Would you like to tell people where they can find you, how they can contact you? Sure. Uh, Probably the best place is LinkedIn, um, you know, as well, but I'm on the other major platforms as well. Less, less proactive. I really go deep, uh, deep insight every day into uh, LinkedIn. So please uh, join my network there on LinkedIn, but I'm on Instagram as Brett Packard. It's, It's all under the same name. I've got a YouTube channel as well called the Packard Network, and I've, and I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. So again, Brett Packard on all the places as well. So that's um, yeah. I look forward to hopefully um, um, sharing and inspiring uh, many of you as well. And if I can, the way I see it, Nasheen, if I can help save somebody five years with something, then that's a big win. And um, I've been able to do that with a few people. So by um, introducing some of these concepts. And hopefully this podcast will save people years with with their journey as well. That would be amazing. And I'm sure I'm sure people are listening have been able to learn a lot. So thank you so much, Brett. It's been an honor and You're a welcome. pleasure talking to you. Great. My pleasure, Nasheen. Thank you. <laughs>